and welcome to another teaching by 119 Ministries. Our ministry teaches that the whole Bible is true and still relevant to believers today. If you would like to learn more on what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Have you ever been told that there is not to be any fire on the Sabbath? Exodus chapter 35 verses 2 through 3. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. For those studying the commandments of God with a desire to apply its truth, not forsake truth, this commandment can often result in some understandable confusion. Quite often, we witness the house of Judah, or Jews, applying this commandment in certain circumstances and in such a way that appears rather extreme. On the flip side, those in mainstream Christianity witness and study what Orthodox Jews have done with this verse and immediately demand the same application from anyone teaching obedience to all of God's commandments. As if the Jews understand everything about God's word perfectly supposedly implying that if one believes all the Old Testament to still be true, then the Jews are the perfect example to emulate. Sadly, this often is done in order to supposedly prove the futility of applying God's commandments for today, that any attempt to keep Yahweh's commandments is obviously absurd, and that men have clearly evolved beyond such outdated commandments. In such an approach, other commandments are discarded as well lumping them into one convenient outdated basket, all because it is understood that one of the supposed purposes of the Messiah was to change the law of God as taught by Paul. It can all quickly become a mess. The over-the-top Jewish interpretation of this verse then becomes an obstacle for mainstream Christians in understanding the whole truth of the word. Likewise, it is often an obstacle for the house of Judah, Jews, as a doctrinal distraction from the true intent, purpose, and wonderful joy the Sabbath has been given to us. Some of the traditional Jewish practices as it relates to Exodus 35 would appear rather odd to many. How can we or do we make sense of this? Some of those odd practices include only using special elevators that do not create a spark, they are refusing to drive cars, or the avoiding of many other such things that can even be loosely interpreted as involving a fire on the Sabbath. While it must be admitted that such restraint and prohibitions are certainly affording parameter guidelines that prevent the breaking of this commandment in the literal or even beyond, at the same time the entire point in obedience to this commandment is simply being missed. In reality, that can become the larger issue. We should consider the teachings of our Lord Yeshua in Mark chapter 7 verses 5 through 16. We certainly do not want to add or subtract from the law of God. However, nor do we want to invent traditions that replace the intent and purpose of the law of God. There is an interpretive balance that requires us to rightly divide the word of truth, meaning there is also a wrong way to divide the truth. The word of God is certainly sharper than a two-edged sword, but sometimes our personal doctrines can really dull and dilute the truth. However, those who really desire to worship in spirit and truth and obey the truth will seek these things out. Sometimes in our studies, we forget the inclusion of context in our hermeneutics to assist in establishing correct understanding and application of God's Word. Sometimes the best question we could ask is, Why? Why would God not want us to light a fire on the Sabbath? This is a very simple question, but offers profound interpretive benefit and hermeneutical application. In verse 3, we find the fire is not to be kindled in the dwellings. Does this mean that if I'm in a forest in the middle of nowhere, away from any dwellings, that I can create a fire on the Sabbath? Technically, the answer is yes, if I already have my wood and I'm not working to collect that wood to create the fire. We can only conclude that there must be a reason why God is focusing on the dwellings of those during this time period as it relates to kindling a fire. 
What purpose did fires in the dwellings serve as opposed to any random fire one might kindle? The telling difference is embedded in the intent and purpose of the commandment, established in the prior verse. Exodus chapter 35, verses 2 through 3. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. The fire we are not to kindle is a fire clearly related to work in some way. This makes sense because the central point of the Sabbath is resting. Thus, it is not necessarily the fire itself that's the issue, as some make it out to be. We should not be focusing on the fire, but the work, which is the opposite of rest, the opposite of the intent of the Sabbath. Anyone focused on the fire has completely missed the point Yahweh was trying to make in his instruction. This explains the difference between the focus on kindling a fire in dwellings and not simply just anywhere. If it was all about not kindling a fire anywhere, then Yahweh would not have limited the instruction about fire on the Sabbath to just the dwellings. Obviously, the fire in the dwellings serves a purpose, and somehow, that purpose is contrary to resting. This begins to speak to what effort it takes to prepare and produce the fire, or what the fire is intended to serve, which is daily work. In the Middle East thousands of years ago, a fire was a central element to facilitate much of the daily work activity. Cooking, cleaning, tool and supply production, are all examples of daily work that required fire. The type of fire God is referring to is a fire to support working. Not only was it a burden of work to prepare for that fire, thus do any such activity before or after the Sabbath, but the fire in context of the dwelling is also intended to serve the working person. This means that one who creates a fire on the Sabbath is intending to work. This is the relationship between fire and work God defines in the context that it occurred in the dwellings. This commandment would have been correctly interpreted in this way by those intended to receive it when Moses delivered it. They understood that. Should we not also understand it in the same way? Should we ignore that or apply that? Those who are all caught up in commandments of men and believe that they're not to push a button or turn on a switch may or may not have their heart in the right place but are certainly missing the intended message God is speaking to regarding this commandment. God is simply stating to not only rest on the day He created for rest, but to not even prepare for or think of work when we are to be resting and focusing on Him. There are principles we can take from this commandment and also apply to our modern circumstances. Each believer should consider these things in their walk. For those who believe there is no modern application here have given this matter little thought in our work-saturated daily lives and busy minds. Presumably, when the prohibition was presented, kindling fire was indeed work. Starting a fire was not as simple as flipping a lighter today or pushing a button, nor is creating fire today intended, quite often, to serve our daily work. Some cultures today still use fire as a central need for daily work. We need to examine and apply these things through the eyes of the giver and receiver of the commandment, not whatever interpretive glasses that we are wearing at the time. Every Bible scholar should agree with such a statement. There is a mainstream practical usage of fire today that is not related to work and was not present in the context of Exodus 35. More often than not, simply keeping warm in colder climates comes to mind in such an example. In such circumstances, applying Exodus 35 today, as intended, would mean having one's preparation for a fire done before the Sabbath, and then using the fire to keep a household warm, but not for daily work. The obvious critical difference to recognize and ask as it relates to Exodus 35 is this. Is the fire intended and used for work? How that question is answered defines a type of fire and thus enabling the correct application of Exodus 35. If this was not the case, are we to believe that those in the first century that were talking and studying to the wee hours of the morning during weekly Shabbat fellowship were not using candles or lanterns? Of course they were. They were doing this before and after the cross. Would that not be defined as lighting a fire in a dwelling? Technically it would. That means that they understood Exodus 35 in the context in which it was given. Lighting a fire in a dwelling 
does not violate Yahweh's commandments as long as it is not being used for work or work to prepare for and maintain the fire on the Sabbath. Are we to believe that they were all sitting around in the dark? That would be just plain silly. The context of Exodus 35 is related to our work activity or simply not resting unless we want to ignore the verse prior to verse 3. Kindling a fire meant something in the context in which it was given. Can it not be agreed that we should practice a commandment as it was given? The conclusion of the matter is this. We should not work to create a fire that is intended to support more work. That is the only way the commandment could have been interpreted when it was given. Such an interpretation completely makes sense given the whole point of the Sabbath in itself. So the questions become this. Should we apply the commandment as it was intended to be interpreted? Or should we apply it how our culture would interpret it? Should the interpretations of the commandments of God change based on every new generation? Or should we interpret them through the generation in which they were given? Should interpretation be based on the culture of the reader? Or the culture of those present and living when the text was given? Hopefully these questions will expose the common sense that we should use in our understanding of Scripture. This is not as complicated as some have made it out to be. Some actually do desire this commandment to be that complicated because they love their traditions of the fathers. Some even want this commandment to be that complicated to use it as an excuse to abandon the Sabbath rest that was made for us. The reality is, is that it's not that complicated. We are to rest, not work. That is for our benefit. We are not to work, force anyone else to work, nor consume ourselves with preparing or thinking about work on a set-apart or holy day. Why would we want to work when he says to rest? We might just find that focusing on God, the Word, instead of traditions of men or things of the world, just happens to resonate well with our spirit. If something about ignoring the daily burdens of the world and then entering into the weekly freedom of spending time with God and His family on the Sabbath is frightening and a burden to us, then we have more complex issues to address rather than simple matters of obedience. Resting and spending time with Yahweh and His family is a blessing, not a burden. It shows our love for Him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 2-3 through 3. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. The focus of the Sabbath is Yahweh and resting, not creating a fire to work. It's as simple as that. We hope that this study has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom.